Uh, let us worship God. Let's seek God's face together by lifting up our hearts and voices to him in the singing of Psalm 30. And we'll sing the opening verses, verses 1 to 5, to the tune St. Lawrence, which is number 117. In the opening of this psalm, we're reminded that the object of our faith is God himself, that even as we sing, our eyes, the eyes of our souls are being raised heavenward to fix upon him. Lord, I will thee extol, for thou hast lifted me on high, and over, over me thou too rejoice, may it's not mine enemy. We'll sing verses 1 to 5. Stand and seek God's face together in prayer. <clears throat> o gracious and glorious God in heaven, we do exalt your great and lofty name. And we do take pleasure in being able to rejoice in you and to recall that you are uh, the living and the true God, to be still and know uh, that you are God. We would seek you early, O Lord, and our souls, we confess, do thirst uh, for you, and our flesh does long for you in a dry and thirsty land. Make us to see that your loving kindness is better to us than, than life itself, that we would find our being, our existence, our all of our cares and concerns, the desires and longings of our hearts to be fixed upon you, the object of love and faith and joy. We pray, O oh God, that you would withdraw our minds uh, from the objects of time and space, that you would uh, loosen our grip on the, the temporal things of, of this world that so often divert us and distract us, so often uh, drag us down into the muck, into the mire. Uh, grant, Lord, that our hearts would be raised high, 
uh, and that we would see that you alone uh, will satisfy and you alone are the God who is altogether sufficient. We pray that as we draw near to your word, that your word would be sweet uh, to our taste, that it would come in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that we as newborn babes uh, would be enabled to desire uh, the sincere milk of the word, to be nourished by it. Grant that these songs of Zion would be uh, made personal to us, that they would be our songs, that they would give vent uh, to the desires and cry of our own heart, that indeed they would shape uh, our affections and our thinking and would direct uh, our whole heart and conscience uh, to you and, and before you. Lord, we, we rejoice that as we raise these praises and prayers that we have a great high priest who is over the house of God and through whom we have access uh, to your holy throne. We rejoice in, in Christ as a glorious and a gracious redeemer. We are thankful that he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, that he is the bread that has come down from heaven, and that your people are enabled by faith to feed uh, upon him, that he is a fountain of living waters from whom we can drink and never uh, thirst again. O oh Lord, how amiable are all of your tabernacles uh, unto us. How delightful the place of your assembled people and the public worship of God uh, is to us. Uh, we pray that your grace would abound uh, amongst us and that uh, we would have the increase of faith and love and all that is found in the knowledge of, of Christ Jesus, uh, our Lord. And we do come, Lord, asking that you would help us to, uh, to be clothed with humility, uh, to come with, with broken uh, and contrite hearts before you, to come uh, conscious of our neediness as those who are longing and hungering for more of your strength. We confess our sins uh, unto you. Oh God, we cannot look upon your holiness uh, without being made aware of how unholy uh, we are. Uh, we cannot see uh, the purity of your countenance as you reveal yourself without seeing the impurity of our own consciences and, and souls before you. And so we would uh, own all of these things and acknowledge them. And we would confess them to you that, Lord, we are far worse than we think of ourselves, uh, far worse than others, even our worst enemies, think of us. Uh, we confess, Lord, that there is much that is to be deplored. And yet we, we carry not uh, these things upon our own shoulders, uh, left, as it were, to sink us into to hell. But we, we come uh, acknowledging them and, and confessing them and repenting of them and turning once again uh, from these sins to you, the living God, uh, for mercy and for deliverance and for help. And we pray that you would purge and cleanse our defiled hearts and that you would cleanse us and wash us with the blood of Jesus and that you would give us strength in the joy of uh, the forgiveness that is found in you and that you would provide afresh your spirit to your people uh, to enable them uh, to continue that holy war against the sin within and against the flesh. We pray, O Lord, that you would grant increased degrees of victory and strength and that you would buoy up the hearts of your people uh, to serve you with fear and to rejoice with trembling. We pray for your blessing upon the cause of Christ, and we think of the ministers in our own presbytery and a denomination as well as, as others, uh, those close to us, even indeed our neighbors, just a few doors down. We think of churches throughout this community and for uh, ministers that you've ordained and sent forth. We pray that you would make all of your ministers to be taught of God and able, therefore, uh, to teach others, that you would be pleased to cause the word to be a vehicle through which sinners are converted, uh, through which uh, your people are confirmed in their faith, 
and others are consoled uh, in the midst of, of all of the tumult of this, this world that you would edify and build up uh, the people of, of God. And that in all of this, that your name would be hallowed, uh, that, your, that you would indeed make holy your name as it is imprinted uh, upon your people and upon uh, your church. Uh, we pray that you would bless the kingdom, that the, the mountain of the Lord's house would be established in the top of, of all of the mountains, uh, that, that it would be exalted above all the hills, and that you would cause uh, the people of this world <clears throat> to be formed into rivers that would flow up that mountain uh, to be taught of, of the Lord, that the nations would be discipled in all that you have uh, commanded us, and that the whole earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of our, our great God. Lord, this is our longing. We, we see so much that dismays us, uh, some of which uh, disillusions us, some of which uh, discourages us. We see so much mess in the world at large and uh, in our immediate surroundings. And we, we pray that you would deliver us from merely having self-interest, our own comforts, uh, our own satisfaction, our own vindication. But grant, Lord, that we would be uh, altogether burdened and weighed down with a sense of your own name and your own glory that is dishonored and defamed, and that we would long with love for you first, and secondly, love for the souls of men, uh, to see your grace visited upon them as well as ourselves, and the light of your countenance lifted up in order that your name would be honored and your glory uh, vindicated in, in all of, of the earth. O oh Lord, strengthen us in the secret place, uh, the, the self-examination of our own hearts, our secret prayers, our walk in fellowship and communion, communion with you. Uh, make us to be uh, most mighty uh, where we are least seen. Uh, grant, O oh God, that we would live as those who, who are living before the all-seeing eye of God. And help us uh, to that end in our worship uh, throughout this Sabbath day and the public services as well as in private. Uh, help us to have a sense of your, your presence and a sense and a recognition of your eye upon us. And may that mold and guide and shape all that we are about in the exercises and service that we render in the worship to you. And we ask all of these things in Christ's glorious name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we come this morning in our sequential singing to Psalm 66 and the opening section, verses 1 to 5. The tune is Eating 10, which is number 54. Tune number 54. Psalm 66, verses 1 to 7, and among other things, the, this, this psalm lays out as a theme uh, some of the works of God, and so our, our affections, our hearts are being directed in that vein. And you'll note in verse 5, uh, this call that comes to us even as we sing, Come, and the works that God hath wrought with admiration see in his working to the sons of men. Most terrible is he. And so may we see those works and worship uh, the one who, who works them. Psalm 66, beginning at verse 1, all lands to God with joyful sounds.
Let us worship God now as we read his word together in the Old Testament scriptures from the book of Proverbs and chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, <clears throat> beginning at verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his heart shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Whoso loveth wisdom rejoiceth his father, but he that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. The king by judgment establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regard not to know it. Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. If a ruler hearken, hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both their eyes. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. A servant will not uh, be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words, there is more hope of a fool than of him. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Whoso as partner with a thief hateth his own soul, he heareth cursing and bereath it not. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's continue to worship the Lord, singing again in Psalm 66 and picking up at verse 8. We'll sing the remainder of the psalm to the tune St. Matthew, which is tune number 157. And in this we continue to extol the Lord for his works.
Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me again in your Bibles in the New Testament to the book of Acts. We'll read together from chapter 4, Acts chapter 4. Let us give careful and reverent attention to the reading of God's holy Word. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John And Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, uh, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, Because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they that uh, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God 
with boldness. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Amen. Please take your Bibles once again and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And we come in our exposition of this fourth Gospel to chapter 19. We'll be taking as our text two verses, verses 38 and 39. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 38 and 39. The title of our sermon is Bold Attachment. Uh, to Christ. We read these words. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. You are conscious, I am sure, that as we read through the Gospel of John, as we preach through the Gospel of John and study and meditate upon it, that John has a very clearly defined purpose in this, this Gospel. He makes it explicit for us at the end of the Gospel, and he brings it out in various places as you read through. His aim, under the blessing of God, is to bring those who have contact and acquaintance with the words of the Gospel of John, to bring them uh, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal is that they might believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he pens uh, this uh, text, these long words, You see over and over again him bringing Christ and his glory to the front as the object of faith. And you see descriptions of the effect that that had on those who saw him during his earthly ministry. He multiplies examples, if you will, as patterns of those who respond to Christ with sincere faith. And John, of course, is is writing with his face set against the tide of unbelief. Because not only was there opposition from uh, the Roman government and, and uh, society, there was opposition, of course, from the Jews who were seeking to stamp out uh, this work of God among his people. There was opposition from within the church, those who had taken and distorted and maligned, twisted uh, the true knowledge of God and had propagated heresies. And so... His face is set against this tide. I mean, the winds are blowing against him as he writes after all of the the others had written their their three Gospels. And we have included here this description of two men, Joseph of Arimathea and, and and Nicodemus, two men, two public leaders, two men who would have been recognized, for example, in the streets of Jerusalem. And they share, as the text makes clear, they share a common weakness. But we also see that matched by the boldness of a joint witness. They have a common weakness, but it is not only matched, it is outstripped by the bold witness that they make for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so our theme is a bold attachment to Christ. We're going to have two, two primary points this morning uh, that we'll be considering in our exposition of, of this passage. For, first of all, uh, concealed disciples. So first of all, concealed disciples, secret, hidden disciples. And you see this description in, at the beginning of verse 38 and the beginning of verse 39. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews. And then in verse 39, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Both descriptions given of these, of these men, Joseph, who has kept secret his, his discipleship uh, to Christ, and Nicodemus, who hid it under the cloak of night in his first uh, coming to the Lord Jesus, describe this whole concept. Indeed, uh, the, the text could be translated um, as it is here, but secretly, it can also be translated, but being concealed for fear of the Jews. So we have here a description of concealed uh, disciples. Joseph of Arimathea makes a single appearance in the Bible, and it is only on this occasion after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, that single appearance is recorded in all four Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all include the account that we have before us. It's as if he appears, to us anyway, out of the middle of nowhere, and then a split second later, he disappears again, and we hear nothing of him in the book of Acts or elsewhere. That's not to say that there wasn't much that could have been written about him. But this is all that the Lord has, has revealed to us. And so I think it's helpful. Let me just in short compass kind of compi uh, compile the information that Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John uh, give to us because they all tell us uh, little bits that are different from each other about this man, Joseph of Arimathea. We're told that he's rich. He's a man of wealth and of great standing. We're told that he, he's powerful so he has position, influence that, uh, that he can exercise. He is a member of the Sanhedrin. Children, you'll, you'll know that the Sanhedrin is uh, the, the ruling council of the Jews, right? The ruling council of the Jews. It's the Sanhedrin that Jesus appeared before after his arrest and was judged by them and so on. We're told that he was held in respect as a public leader. It's interesting that in the Greek, it's the Joseph of Arimathea. In other words, this is someone that those who first read John's gospel would have probably known. They could have pulled up a, a mental image of him in their head. He was held in much respect among his people. We're told that he was good and righteous and that he was looking for the kingdom of God. In other words, he was a devout Jew who was, who was longing for the appearance of the Christ, of the Messiah, the promised one who was to come. And lastly, we see, as we do here in John, that he considered himself a disciple of Jesus, being a disciple of, of Jesus. Apparently, he had continued uh, in his position on the Sanhedrin uh, up to this point, at least, because uh, we read in Matthew 23 and uh, verse 51 that when the Sanhedrin was opposing the Lord Jesus Christ, he was there, though he did not consent. The text says, uh, speaking of, of Joseph, a counselor, he was a good man and a just, the same had not consented to the council and deed of them. And so whether through absence or silence or through verbal uh, uh, confrontation, whatever the case may be, he did not consent uh, to what they had done in their condemnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but we're told that he was a disciple that was secret, a concealed disciple. Now, Nicodemus is not new to us. So in, in the Gospel of John, this is the third occasion in which he has appeared uh, in this, this text, the first is the most well-known in John chapter 3, where we're told that uh, this teacher, this, this leader, this 
rabbi of, of the Jews had snuck uh, to see Christ under the cover of night. And we have, of course, the description of that conversation that transpired between our Lord and Nicodemus. He was a secret inquirer. He pops up again, as you may recall, in chapter 7 and verse 51. And there, uh, there's a little more boldness, but he, he's still serving uh, something like a timid advocate where he objects and says, you know, do we condemn a man against the law, you know, without witnesses and, and so on. He poses that, that question. And then we have him here uh, the third time. And interestingly, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all three times when Nicodemus comes up, we have the same description. At first, the one who at first came to Jesus by night. And so it's being underlined, this secrecy, this, uh, this kind of quiet, tacit uh, follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is highlighted. We're told more, so this is kind of a recap on what we know of these two men. We're told, we're told more because we're told about what, what exactly in the case of Joseph was the problem, what was the cause, what was the motivation. It says, but secretly for fear of the Jews. <clears throat> and so it was fear that had made him a secret or concealed <clears throat> disciple of the Lord Jesus. We read in Proverbs 29 earlier in the service that the fear of man <clears throat> bringeth a snare. So it's, it's laying a trap and we become entangled in it. And this is always the case. You will know in various degrees from your own <clears throat> experience. The fear of man, being concerned about the eye of man, the thoughts of men, what others uh, think in their assessment of us, it is like being bound up. It is like someone taking and tying ropes and making knots and entangling our feet and restricting us. Right? There's a restriction and ensnaring influence that it has. So that we're not free. We're not, we're not free to, to think and be and say what we ought. But rather, we're tied in knots as it were. <clears throat> and we're trapped under the influence of the fear of men. And Joseph of Arimathea knew something of this. An open commitment to Christ for him would have brought all sorts of repercussions. It would have brought reprisals uh, from the hands of the Jews. I mean, he would have been threatened with the possibility of being cast out of the synagogue, which, which is a lot more than just being told, you can't come to synagogue. It would have been, he would have been an outcast of, of Jewish society as a whole. And that would have had all sorts of far-reaching implications for him. <clears throat> we can appreciate that. We can, we can see that. And it's, it's not as if things have changed today. It's not as if things have ever changed nearly in any day. Right? There's an environment that we walk in and that we breathe in. And there are influences that are swirling around us. And they're opposed to the Lord, and they're opposed to His Word, and they're opposed to His glory, and therefore they're opposed to His, His people. And so society sets the context and says, well, how should we view people like Christians, devout, sincere, sober Christians? How should we view them? And they call the shots, and they make the labels, and they define the parameters, and they're the ones who are setting the, the, the stage, as it were. And so there's the risk of being a bigot. If you object to the immorality of sexual perversion, you're a homophobe or you're a bigot. Or if you object to the feminist agenda or something, well, then you are, uh, you're a chauvinist or something else. Uh, there's the whole idea of being extremists, of being radicals. And the, the point is that it's unreasonable. I mean, it's okay to have interest in Jesus. It's okay to believe the Bible. But it should be, in their minds, balanced. It should be reasonable, moderate, acceptable, if you will. What does all that mean? Well, that's all code word for saying, as long as you don't contradict our wickedness. That's what it means. You're unreasonable if, you, if what you believe and therefore what you say contradicts our wickedness. 
Oh, you can say, well, when it's put in that light, now we set the balance back on the table and we see who is it that's really imbalanced. Those who are saying, you know, it's our way or the highway in that sense, and we are, we are, we are overtly opposed to what God is and what God, God says. And so the world says, well, we'll tolerate a tame, a tame Christianity. That's, toler- that's tolerable. But what does it mean to be tame? It means to be controlled. Right? We'll, we'll tolerate a tame Christianity. That is a Christianity that we get to control, the world. Well, I'm sorry, but the problem is that there is a God in heaven. And, and no one tames, no one restricts, no one, uh, no one can uh, put God within parameters and, and rule over him or control him. And that option is not on the table for anyone and certainly not for the Christian. And therefore, let God be true, though all men be liars. That means billions of people. Let them all be liars, but let God be true. The irony, of course, is that in the midst of all of this business, there are these great movements, right, of the coming out movement and people who are, who, who, who are coming out of the closet to proclaim openly, publicly, boldly their sexual perversion. And they'll say, well, they, this person's come out of the closet and they've, they've you know, proclaimed the, the wickedness of their, their life and behavior and so on. And yet simultaneously, this is the irony, we have Christians increasingly becoming fearful and of being tempted to keep their heads down, being tempted to keep their heads down and their mouths shut. What in the world is happening? The wicked are being bolder in their wickedness, and the church is being tempted to, to, to follow as, from a distance, as it were, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man is coupled with a concern for the praise of, of man. You remember how Jesus puts it in, in John 12 where he says in verse 42, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. And this may include J- Joseph of Arimathea. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For, here we have it, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So now we have two things at play. We have the fear of men, and we have a lust for the praise of of man, the accolades, that sense which everyone has in some degree naturally, you want to be loved, you want to be accepted, you want people to, to like you, but, but Jesus is saying they're, they love, right? they're passionate about the praise of men more than the praise of God. So God is put under the mere faces of, of men. There's a concern for acceptance. People are very concerned about this. I mean, they very concerned about how they look, you know, their appearance, their haircut and their whatever else, their clothes and how they carry themselves, how they're perceived by other people. Well, in, in all of these cases, what's, what's happening when there's an inversion and God is put on the bottom and man is put on the top, We need to see that for what it is. Man is huge. Man is a giant. Man is a monster that everyone kowtows to. And God has been shrunk and reduced and made insignificant. When we see it like that, it's a wake-up call. It's a trumpet blown in our ears. And we begin to say, okay, we have to see through the motivations and some of the things that we're being tempted to be influenced by. Am I living before the all-seeing eye of a, a majestic and glorious God? Or am I really, have I, have I reduced him, as it were, to the, 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 side, the side place or the closet? And man has become, has, is now looming large in my, in my mind. I mean, you can imagine, children, imagine with me, this is not possible, so this is pretend. But imagine two ants, and you're out in the yard, and you could speak ant language, and you can magnify them with a microphone, and you're listening to two ants. 
and, and they're talking to each other, and one ant is saying, I can carry bigger breadcrumbs than you can, and the other is saying, well, I can run to the ant uh, hole faster than you can, and, one, and the other one says back, well, you know, I have prettier ant eyes than you do, and so on. You would laugh. You would fall on your back and hold your belly, and you would laugh. How ludicrous, how ridiculous it is. Uh, to, to, for two ends to be speaking like this. It's not that different from ourselves, right? Those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise, the Bible says. And two creatures who are saying, I'm prettier, I'm stronger, I'm faster, I'm smarter, I'm more powerful, you know, I have more talents in this area or the other. It's, it's, it's ludicrous. It really is laughable, if you will. But the root of it, of course, is that God is small and man is big. And again, another point of irony here is that even men, even people, do not esteem and ultimately do not respect slimy cowardice, the kind that you find with yes men, those who are always, yes, 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 I'm going to be the one who you know, conforms, really even mankind loses respect for those sorts of people, which means in the end you don't even get the thing that you were looking for. You think back to the days of the Reformation, John Knox, for example, how many of his contemporaries do you remember? How many, how many of his contemporaries who were saying, we should cut a deal with the queen, we should not be so extreme, we should, we should you know, kind of take the, the via media, the middle way, and, and find a, a way to get along with people in order that we can uh, go forward and so on. You know none of their names. You know the name of John Knox. John Knox stood up and said, it's God's way, period. He, and he was an extremist. And he went to overwhelmingly great lengths because of his passion for the glory of Christ and the glory of God. And he stood against the face of men. Same thing with the Covenanters. I mean, do you know how many hundreds of, con uh, of Presbyterian ministers conformed to the demands of the king and who, who took the indulgence and said, well, you know, we have to be reasonable and, and, you know, we don't want to be put out of our pulpits. If we stay in our pulpits, we'll be able to still feed the sheep and help them and teach them and we'll still be able to be active and do all these good things. They had long lists of reasons. How many other names do you remember? Probably zero. But you remember those who all of society said were nutcases, irrational extremists, who said it's Christ's way, or death will take martyrdom. We would rather suffer than sin. And you know Cargyle, and you know Cameron, and you know uh, Rennick, and, and the names of, 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 of many others. The fact is that we have to, we have to be on guard against our own hearts. Because whenever we switch in our minds from saying, what will God say? And we switch to saying, what will man say? We're in deep trouble. At that point, we are in deep trouble. We are in, we are in a weakened, vulnerable state. Well, both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus struggled with, with some of this. I mean, both of them were rich. And that means they had more to lose. I mean, a person who was maybe a beggar and they come to see Christ, they can attach themselves to Christ. There's less for them to lose. But for men of power and position and great wealth, these rich, rich men, they had a lot to lose if they turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't wrong, of course, for them to be rich, but being rich has its, its vulnerabilities because you, you become preoccupied with the cares of this world far more than those who don't have those cares. And so the development of one's property and the, you know, the, the, the increase of one's resources and protection and so on and so forth, these things end up taking a, a lot of, of, of attention and potentially a lot of, of one's heart, though not, not, though not necessarily. But you think in reverse, so we're talking about concealed disciples here. I want you to think with me briefly before we go to the second point about what this cost them, being a concealed disciple. That has a price tag. 
There is loss that comes as a result of that. What was the cost for them? Think with me about what this would have included. Well, there was a loss of opportunity for fellowship with Christ. They're coming now. Christ is crucified. He's dead. And we'll come to that. But they lost those three years of sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. At least in Nicodemus's case, we know that it was early on in Jesus' ministry that he first was drawn to him and, and, and had interest in him and so on. And it's true. Nicodemus got John 3. And we all know John chapter 3. We love John chapter 3. It's wonderful, the truths that Nicodemus received on that, on that occasion. But these two men lost three years of being with Jesus, you know, day and night, listening, receiving his instruction, following and seeing his, his example, sitting at his feet, that was lost. My friends, that's a significant loss of being a concealed disciple. You lose things. They also lost the privilege of standing with Christ and giving him glory during his earthly ministry. So to stand visibly, publicly, vigilantly with the Savior. And to be publicly attaching oneself to the Savior. That's a loss. That was a loss to them. There's, we could multiply things. There was the loss of Christian fellowship. I mean the camaraderie amongst the disciples and all that would have taken place in, in that context as well. We know the Bible says we're members of the body and that as members, our growth is dependent on the mutual interaction, the edification, the exhortations, the prayers, and all of the other means of support that are part of being the body of, of Christ Jesus. Instead, they had a restricted amount of access and fellowship, and they were you know, Joseph is with the Sanhedrin, and Joseph is, you know, with unbelieving people. Nicodemus, no doubt, in some measure as, as well. We're not to neglect ourselves, the, the assembling of ourselves together. That's a loss to them. It was also a colossal loss that they didn't, were not able sooner to employ all the gifts, all the graces, all of the blessings that the Lord had given them. They were not sooner able to employ all of that for God's glory. That's a loss. You know, we, we rejoice with great joy, and the heavens do as well, at the conversion of someone in their 80s. To see the Lord come at the 11th hour and redeem a sinner is glorious. But those who are converted at 80 will tell you there is substantial loss. And those who are converted and who come and profess Christ at a young age, there is so much gain. All of those minutes, those hours, days, weeks, months, years that are employed in fellowship with Christ and in using and harnessing all of the, the gifts, the physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, all of the assets and resources that the Lord's given us for his glory. And the exponential increase, for example, of treasure laid up in heaven. And glory brought to our great God. Secretly, you know, silence is dangerous. Whereas instead, visibility, public open attachment to Christ is actually safe. Because what happens? Well, with Paul, he's a Pharisee, he's a leader, he's a, he's a substantial person, a scholar, known to be a scholar. He loses all of that, and he ends up, for example, with Silas in prison. Has he lost anything? He's in the safest place on the planet because he's with the Lord. And there they are singing the Psalms at midnight. And he has fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, he is used by God under the inspiration of the Holy Scripture to write, write part of the New Testament, to go and testify before kings. Many great things that God used him for. But even in the dungeon, in the prison, he was in the safest possible place. Where as long as a person is silent, they are in danger. And so first of all, we see concealed disciples. Secondly, courageous disciples. I told you they share a weakness, but it's matched and outstripped, outstripped 
by the bold witness that they make. Secondly, we see courageous disciples. It goes on to say that Joseph went to Pilate to ask, the, to ask for the body of Christ. Nicodemus joins him in taking and preparing the body of the Lord Jesus Christ for burial. So the question comes, you, you listen to the first point, concealed Christian, or concealed disciple, and the question undoubtedly has come to your mind. I hope it has. Can a true Christian remain a hidden Christian? That's the question. Can a true Christian remain a concealed Christian? Well, thankfully, we don't have to employ conjecture, and we don't have to um, guess. The Lord's told us himself. In Matthew, as you well know, in Matthew chapter 10, he gives us a very clear and straightforward answer in verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Can a true Christian remain a hidden Christian? The answer is an unequivocal no. They cannot remain endlessly a hidden Christian. You know, the early church, the patristic era, they spent a lot of time on this during the waves of Roman persecution, a lot written. Time of the Reformation, Calvin had to deal with it. Those who wanted to stay in the Roman Catholic Church and say, well, we're going to hold to true doctrine and, and, and keep it to ourselves, as it were. He wrote stuff on it. I mean, this is not something common. I mean, this is not something that is new to, to us. Besides, think of what it means for, for a person's own uh, experience. I mean, there's no assurance. What kind of assurance can a person have? There's no assurance without an open public profession and attachment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these two men, they could no longer remain silent. They could no longer remain silent. And interestingly, when Mark describes Joseph going to Pilate, it says he took courage or it was with bravery, with boldness. He mustered himself. He reached a point, a turning point, and he said, now is the time, and I am going to pledge myself, and I'm publicly going to take a stand for the, for the Savior. And so he took courage and went to Pilate in the face of all the other Sanhedrin, in face of all the Jewish priests and others, in face of the Roman establishment, he said, I am a friend of the Savior. I am a, I am a devoted disciple of Christ. If not before, now I stand with him. And it is a beautiful boldness. It is a beautiful boldness. It's easy to come to that first part of the text and say, well, secretly, a concealed disciple. And for us to kind of look down on these two men, and we will have erred and erred significantly if we do, to, do, do so. This is beautiful boldness. Remember, let's remember the context. Remember, all of the other disciples have scattered like pigeons. Peter is out weeping, having denied the Lord Jesus. And the others have fled. All the other disciples have scattered. And here you have these two unlikely, unexpected men. These two making at the most vulnerable, the most difficult time, a, a public allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they make this public attachment to Christ when it is least advantageous to them. Right? It appears as if Christ is defeated. And they don't have, like earlier, you know, I'm going to leave all and follow Christ. And I have, as it were, I'm, I have the advantage of Christ's presence in earthly ministry. Right? This is a terribly vulnerable time. And yet they're being bold for the Lord. So the question for me is, I come to texts like this and I'm full of questions. Some of which you've already heard. But one of the questions is this, 
What brought the change? All the other disciples have scattered. This is the least advantageous time to make a public stand for Christ. All that it's going to bring down upon their heads and so on. Why now? What is it that would have brought them to this place at this juncture? What brought the change? And I think we can say, I think we can say with a measure of confidence what the answer is. Undoubtedly, it is what they saw and what they heard at the cross. They stood. They're there. They're seeing it. They're watching all these events unfold. They're hearing, undoubtedly, the words that are coming from the Savior's mouth. And Jesus is exemplifying his power yet and taking two, as it were, infant believers and bringing them forward even while hanging on the cross to greater degrees of maturity. You see the power of the cross. It didn't happen. This, this, this point in their life didn't happen during Christ's miracles. It didn't happen at the Sermon on the Mount <coughs> or under his teaching on other occasions. It is the, it's at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is... The New Testament, the whole New Testament makes this clear. That is because the death of the cross is the greatest power in all of the world to bolster one's faith. This is why we preach Christ crucified. This is why we must preach Christ crucified. Because there is more quickening and efficacious power found in setting forth Christ crucified than there is anywhere else. These two men experienced it live. They experienced it in the moment itself. And seeing and and the Holy Spirit working in them and putting all of the pieces together as to what exactly is transpiring before their eyes and hearing the powerful words of the God-man himself from the cross. They are brought from secrecy to open public attachment to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is beautiful fruit. I mean, here is Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea is honoring Christ at the point of greatest dishonor. He's honoring the Lord Jesus Christ when everyone else has forsook him. He doesn't have the attending support network of the other disciples, as it were. He honors the Lord Jesus Christ when he is dead. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was no longer physically with him. And so fear is banished. These are courageous disciples. Fear is banished. And one can only imagine, you know, what transpired. And just as they fastened the body to the cross and hoisted it up and dropped it in the hole. No doubt they set the cross back down and Joseph would have been the one to go and to to see the cross set down and to pull out the nails from his hands and his feet and to be the one who lovingly handled the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in preparation for his, his burial. You think of what else this cost him. I've mentioned this this previously. What's the context again? Well, we're on the eve of a high Sabbath, and it's Passover time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You know the law. You know the book of Leviticus. To touch a dead body renders you unclean, and that keeps you from the temple and from divine ordinances and sends you into a process of purification and so on. And so we hear here both of these men are handling the dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ, rendered unclean on the feast, on the brink of of one of the greatest feasts of the Jewish Old Testament. It cost him. Nicodemus as well. Perhaps Nicodemus is emboldened by Joseph of Arimathea. Perhaps he hears about it before he goes to Pilate or sees him uh, that he's going to Pilate. Perhaps the influence of of one man who had been in secret coming and saying, no, I am going to follow the Savior, was the means of bringing out with boldness 
Nicodemus as well. The text doesn't tell us for sure, but Nicodemus shows himself to be a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who had come by night previously now comes by day and stands in the face of the multitude openly. He takes his great wealth and he employs it in the expensive purchases of this mixture, a hundred pound weight of myrrh with aloes, in order that the, the body of Christ might be buried with the dignity that it deserves. There's something here for us, I think. The Lord's dealings with a soul are often mysterious. And there's great diversity of, of experience. I mean, there are some who have a, a small beginning, some who have a, a faltering and, and weak beginning. And in the end, they're brought to love the Lord Jesus Christ and they're brought to greater depths and strength in the end, at last, than anyone would have ever expected. And there should be a measure of patience. Well, we have, in one sense, no patience for a secrecy in connection to Jesus and ought not. At the other hand, we have a patience with, with people and not all are like Paul, taken in one fell swoop from the depths and 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 catapulted uh, to the top, as it were, and enabled to go out with, with great boldness. Others are brought along patiently and, and um, carefully by the Lord Jesus. But those who know the Lord in sincerity are brought along, and they are brought to testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is as needed in our own day as it has ever been. I mean, worldliness has filled the church to the brim. We have all the prevailing winds of our society that are blowing against biblical doctrine, against biblical morality, and, and so on. It is not time to stand by. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ is being forsaken, when even some of his people are scattering like pigeons, and where all of the temptations to, to hide our candle under a bushel are as strong as ever. This is the time not to blend in with those that are around us, not to give way to a tacit, silent attachment to the Lord Jesus, but to openly and boldly lay claim to him and his glory and his truth and his word. Not a timid, not an aloof posture, but one of boldness. Boldness brings usefulness, doesn't it? We read in, in, in Acts 4, the Jews bring all of their weight, all their power, all their influence. They threaten, they try to terrify the disciples. And when you hear the disciples saying things like, well, should we obey God or man? Remember what's behind that. The reason they're saying that is because for them, God is huge. And these, you know, the Sanhedrin and the leaders and all the who's who have been shrunk against the backdrop of the majesty of God to being infinitesimally small. And so that's what's taking place. And they're saying, should we obey you or obey God? And they threaten them and say, we're going to beat you and we're going to do all these terrible things to you and so on. What do they do? The church gets together and they pray for boldness. What's the Lord do? He answers their prayer immediately. He gives them the Holy Spirit and they go out proclaiming God's word with boldness. It's not as if the disciples were in and of themselves by nature, personality, temperament, or anything else, just made fearless individuals. They saw their need and they asked God, Lord, give me boldness. We lack it. We need it. We don't have it. And the Lord heard their prayer. He answered their prayer. He gave them, imparted boldness to them, and they bore witness against the face of all the opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact is, the darker the world, the brighter the Christian shines. The more blinding the Christian's witness is 
in terms of its brightness. At the end of the day, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus saw in the Lord Jesus Christ the divine love of God pouring through his person and work. They could see here is the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said from the onset, who taketh away the sins of the world. And we too look upon Christ crucified. We know that the love of Christ is what carried him to be wrongly and publicly condemned for us. Christ subjected himself in love. He was nailed to a cross in love. He bore up under the wrath of God in love for his people. In love, he was publicly condemned. The Christian has that love poured into our hearts, as we'll hear more this afternoon. That love is poured into our hearts. And it, 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 there's a reciprocation, right? It, it ends up producing a transformation in us so that our response is to love him. And our love for Christ means that we will, by God's grace, even publicly be condemned for him. This is the story of the martyrs, isn't it? All, there are all sorts of grades and degrees of suffering for Christ, from very small and unnoticed to the greatest of martyrdom. They all have the same, the same motivation. It's love for the Lord Jesus Christ. A martyr can say, man, you are small to me. And your condemnation is insignificant to me, and, and the Lord is great. And the Lord's love is what compels and constrains me. And I would sooner part with my, my piddly life than to part with him in his glory. It's love for Christ that will lead us to being publicly attached to him, and if need be, publicly condemned for him. God is big, infinitely big. Think about, in closing, the last day. It's always helpful to turn to the last chapter. Always helpful to go to the end, as I often do with you in the preaching of God's Word. Because we can get things super crystal clear by looking at the end, remembering, you know, what, how does all of this play out? It gives clarity to what sometimes seems foggy to us at present. On the last day, everyone, and I don't mean just the believers. I mean unbelievers. I mean everyone. On the last day, every single solitary soul is going to view man, fellow creatures, as infinitesimally small. The most powerful, the richest, the most influential, the most popular people in the whole world, when they get to the last day, their fan base and those who followed them is going to mean zilch to them, absolutely below zero to them. Man will be nothing, and God will be all. He will be all in all. And what God, seeing him, seeing Christ and the glory of God in him, and seeing the revelation of his majesty will vaporize everything else. It will consume every soul's full attention. So that's where you're heading. You're going to be there. I'll be there with you. I will meet you and see you on that last day. Every last one of you. We will be resurrected and assembled together before the throne of God. And I'm telling you, right here and right now, when you arrive at that point, and you will, God will be huge and man will be nothing to you. And so the call is, that's a reality check. You come back to 2018, here at the beginning of June, and you say, think reality now. God is what is significant and weighty and huge. Man is a very little consequence. And may the Lord work grace in you as you look upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the crucified Lord. May he draw out your heart to a bold attachment, a bold attachment to him and to his glory. Let's stand together for prayer.
Almighty God in heaven, we cannot calculate the majesty and glory that belongs unto you. And we acknowledge it. We acknowledge, O Lord, that you are, you are the God who fills all things, the God before whom we have to do. And we pray that you would cause Christ crucified and the love that you manifest in his atoning death to be magnified in our own hearts and minds. And grant that we would have that love shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that we would be drawn out in faith and in love and in sincere pursuit of his glory, that we might boldly attach and pledge our allegiance to him above and beyond all others, to love your praise above the praise of men. O oh Lord, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your tenderness. We thank you for all of the ways in which you woo and draw men and women and boys and girls to yourself. And we pray that you would have the triumph, that you would have the victory in our souls, and that it would redound to your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verses 11 to 15. The tune is Dundee, which is number 50. Psalm 22, verses 11 to 15. And to be very open and honest with you, I had, when I picked the psalm, had anticipated that we would cover the whole end of, of the chapter, which includes Christ's burial. And um, we only made it two verses this morning, but you'll notice uh, in verse 15 the reference uh, My strength is like a pot shirt's dried. My tongue, it cleaveth fast unto my jaws. And then this phrase, and to the dust of death, thou brought me hast. And so it's bringing out one aspect of Christ's work in his, his burial. Let's sing verses 11 to 15.
benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.